Welcome to today's broadcast. I'm excited to be here. I have a powerful message that I would like to share with you. The title of today's message is, Why Do We Call Jesus King? So the question is, personal, why is Jesus King? I'm going to go straight into the word. Turn with me to Isaiah, the 45th chapter, and the 20th verse, and it reads, Assemble yourselves and come. Draw near together, ye that are escaped of the nations. They have no knowledge that set up the wood of their graving image and pray unto a God that cannot save. How many people are praying to gods that cannot save? How many of us are following religions that has great literature, rich in culture, traditions, but cannot save. It's a lot of philosophies, a lot of theologies, a lot of social norms, a lot of solidarity and unity, a lot of things that can bring people together to have a good time and experience life in a way that seems full of happiness. This same thing like a family reunion, everybody come together and the barbecue is good, the drink is good, the coleslaw, the corn, the pie, the cakes, the atmosphere, the music's jumping, and everybody's having a good time. And then that one person, then two, then three had too much to drink. This person now brings back up old behavior and resurrect past stuff from when you was little. And all of a sudden, this atmosphere that was so powerful and so beautiful just moments ago is now wrecked. Because now grandmama got to come in, mama them got to come in, y'all stop that, y'all behave, why y'all always got to act like this? See, now something that seemed beautiful turned because that type of happiness by false traditions, false religions, It'll make you feel good for a minute, but yet there's no salvation in it. And one of the beautiful, most powerful things that God has shown me dealing with the word of salvation, he showed me that like a car that's being driven in, you total the car. It doesn't matter how much the car costs. Whether it was a Bugatti, a Lamborghini, a Mercedes-Benz, or a Ford Focus. They all do the same thing. They transport you from one place to another. But yet, the Lamborghini to the person who spent big money for it, it's a jewel to him. The Ford Focus to a person who no longer have to catch the bus to work, it's a jewel to them. So the car being totaled, has an impact on either person. But yet, the fact that this car's total mean you can never have it again. And so that word salvage comes from the word junkyard. So when we look at salvation, God showed me this definition, which means is broken and damaged beyond human repair. That's right, as people, we've been broken and damaged beyond human repair. So that means philosophers can't save you. Dr. Field and Oprah and other wise people can't save you. They're beautiful people, but they can't save you. We go to the best of the best seeking advice. But they can't save you. 
We go back into the monuments of history and we read the grace, the wise sages, and but they can't save you. And so why is Jesus king in your life is the question. Because again, we talking about a universal Jesus, not a 2000 year old Jesus. Because that Jesus hung on the cross and took on sin. But yet, he resurrected. He is a living God. Like this verse said, assemble yourself means come together. You know the church ecclesia means the assembly, the coming out. The calling together, coming out from what? From pagan practices. From idolatry. From secular humanism. From within your own self, come out of your own egos, out of your own self-concept. That was prevalent in the Tower of Babel when they said, let us make a name for ourselves. Different than being created in God's image and likeness. So the scripture says, assemble yourselves, draw near together. Ye that escaped of the nations. Many of us has been in bondage to many situations. We have escaped being in gangs, the street fraternities. We have escaped being in the drug culture where every day we wake up, we drinking and smoking. We have escaped being trapped on taking naked pictures on Instagram and going to web shops and posing naked and going to strip clubs and being caught up. We have escaped running around from one woman to woman or man to man and promiscuity, feeling the only way we can have pleasures by multiple people. We have escaped this mindset of believing that the only way we can get ahead as black men in America is by creating a subculture that sells drugs, that commit crimes, that does everything on the black market, that boosts out of stores, that do home invasions, that do carjackings, you know, that sell pills and sell weed. And we got to do it this way because this is a white man's world. We can't succeed through matriculating through the universities because after all, the Constitution was not written for our people that our four founding fathers when, when this was composed, we were indentured servants. And so, therefore, this is the white man's world and this is the white man's Bible. And so we can't succeed because we have been trapped into a mindset, into thinking false, into putting God in the box in terms of ethnicity and culture. But yet we don't even have that right. We know who the original man is. The world know who the original man is. We know we know that if you look at the ge geography in the Bible and look at these places on the map, we know that due to the climate of being 90 and 100 degrees, what pigmentation, the skin color of the people were. But yet when we look at Jesus said something so powerful. He said, there's neither Jew nor Gentile. So he eliminated culture. Why? Because our derivative of who we really are is spirit. Enclosed in a body with a soul. So a spirit then, if you have knowledge of self, you understand that you come from God, which is a spiritual culture. And so I have to ask you again, why is Jesus king? Because if Jesus is king of your life, then he's Lord. You know, we get the word landlord because they own the property. And if you don't obey the dictates that the landlord set, because he may say no pets, no children. Or no one allowed to live in a house that's not on the lease. If you disobey those things, then you are evicted. 
You have to obey the rules of the landlord. And so Jesus then, being king of kings and lords of lords, he have statues and rules. He say, if you keep my commandments, you love me. And this is the thing that's powerful because he asked Peter this question. Nowhere else in scripture does Jesus ask a person, do you love me? He asked Peter this question three times. And, and, and Peter acted offended like, Lord, you know why are you asking me this? It's clear why Jesus asked it. Because the old adage that actions are louder than words. Peter, you walked with me for years. But yet you denied me when it got time for you to go through the process of sanctification or go through the process of lay your, down, your life down for others or go through the process of thinking more than yourself. I told you you would be fishermen of men. And the bait to catch men is the tool and the net of loving kindness. But yet, if you think self and be selfish, then you can't love others because you're too concerned about what it's going to cost you to reach out a helping hand. What is it going to cost you to help pay somebody's bills? What is it going to cost you in time to take time to listen? What is it going to cost you to be silent and let somebody vent? What is it going to cost you to give somebody a ride back and forth to work? What is it going to cost you on your day off to go visit the sick, to go in old folks' home or hospitals? What is it going to cost you to reach into your bill money to tie the offer to help fund God's work in the kingdom? What is it going to cost you and so many of us have escaped these things that put us in chains, but many of us are still there. Many of us are still ingrained in the mentality of thinking that this is a system that's not designed for the Afro-Americans or the Africans here upon the shores of America to make it and excel. We can excel like any other people. We matriculated from great colleges, Morehouse and Spielman and Tuskegee and, 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 and Berkeley and all type of colleges, Harvard, Yale. Them colleges are not just for Caucasians and Europeans. We just need to apply ourselves. But the thing is, we are putting God's kingdom secondary like it's a subculture we go on a church Sunday service to be entertained going to Sunday service to be made to feel good going to Sunday service out of custom and tradition so again why is Jesus king why is Jesus king of your life? Is he royalty to you? Are you a royal subject? Do you understand that your citizenship is in heaven? See, we pray even wrong. We pray from the earth up. We in the earth looking up to heaven praying. When we have to understand our lives are hid in Christ Jesus, who sits in authority in heaven. That's what it means when he says he sits on the right hand of the Father. The right hand means authority, sits in the place of authority. In the heavens, our citizenship is in heaven. So then, we are supposed to see from a spiritual mind and perspective. And look down in our physical circumstances and situations and recognize what's out of line with our spiritual home and purpose. And then speak change into the situation. So then, why is Jesus king? You know, when Jesus came riding in on a donkey. And the people said, Hosanna, Hosanna, which means save us. 
they was okay when they thought that Jesus came to free them from paying Caesar and Rome taxes, from following their rules, so that they could live any way they wanted to live. But when they seen that Jesus didn't come for that, that he came to rule in the spirit, which is supposed to control the flesh and kill, crucify the appetites of the flesh, the things that lead you to be ungodly. They said, crucify him. They didn't want him as king. Even when faced with being set free, and the choice was given between him and Barabbas, and Pontius Pilate said, hey, you Jews, I'm not a Jew. This is the king of the Jews. Why do you bring him to me? And the Jews say he is breaking the law. And our law doesn't allow us to kill. Now, that's a powerful lie right there. Because under the law, the wages of sin is death. I for I, two for two. People were stoned to death, put to death for sin. So if Jesus broke a law, then it would be lawful for you to kill him. But see, here's the truth in the statement. Jesus knew no sin. So therefore, they would have broke the law by killing them because the law says, thou shall not commit murder. It's lawful to put a person under the death if they sin, because the wages of sin is death. But since he didn't sin, they would have to commit murder. So what they done is accuse him of treason of an earthly law and had the world killing mm. and see that way they think that their hands were clean and see that's what a lot of us think our hands are clean when we turn our kids over to the juvenile system I don't have to deal with them no more my hands are clean I could just say I left it in the Lord's hand or put a put a put 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 our put our parents in old folks hospice Sinners, so we won't have to take care of them no more because we want to run out and party and do things. Our hands are clean. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't turn over our elders when you do not have the wherewithal to provide for them, when they really need help and they're at a capacity to where you're not trained to do it. So don't mistake what I'm saying. I am saying that a lot of people do wash their hands of their siblings, their loved ones, and their spouse. I'm through with you. No mercy, no forgiveness, no grace. They treat family as if we are under the law. Eye for eye, two for a tooth. Again, here's a problem in Christendom, where divorce rate is high as the world. When we go stand before a judge and say we have irreconcilable differences. Okay, right there, somebody's telling a major lie. Because the Bible says that I have given you a ministry of reconciliation. So God said I've given you the power to reconcile, to be made friends again. So if you are coming, standing before a judge telling him that you cannot reconcile when you are filled with the spirit, he and she is filled with the spirit. How is it that two spirit filled people can no longer get along? If this is the case, then you have to throw out the scripture. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. No weapon formed against me should prosper. Greater is he to send me to send the world. I can do above and all what I may ask or think according to the power that worketh in me. 
There's nothing too hard for God. See, all of them scriptures then, how can you quote them scriptures when something as a disagreement or something as uh, act well, a person done something wrong. Now you can't overcome it. Now you got to get divorced. God says, let no man put asunder what I have joined together. If your marriage is from God, how are you then conquered by things of the world? When Jesus said, fear not, I have overcome the world. And so then why is Jesus king? If he does not rule, and reign in your life and sovereignty where his word reigns, where his word is the center of your life. How is Jesus king if his love does not reflect in your life through application? How is Jesus king if he does not sit on the throne in your life? See, we make other things, we look at things and we think they're innocuous, think that they're innocent. Statements like American Idol. <laughs> Idolatry is a sin. So we're teaching our young folks that if you got a voice, if you can sing, we'll crown you American Idol. We'll idolize your voice, your talent, your gift, and not the giver of the gift. And so we get in chains of bondage in that way of thinking. And so now we chasing Hollywood. Now we chasing record deals. Now we chasing movie scripts. Thinking that man can cause you to prosper. But God says, cursed is he who puts his trust in man. Sunday service again. Why are we here? A lot of Ministry now is just feel-good messages. You never hear talk about sin. You never hear messages of conviction. And I'm not one to beat you down with the Bible. But being holy is God's word. Being sanctified is still God's way. See, we want to bypass the process. And that's what's wrong in relationships because Christ is not king. Even in relationships in the church. Because again, I'm going to get real raw and rare, come straight to it. This is why prostitution succeeds, strip clubs succeed, escort service succeeds, pornography succeeds. Why? Because every man who deals with these type of situations are bypassing the process of a relationship. See, I don't want to get to take the time to get to know your ideologies, what you believe as a woman, what you care for as a woman, what you feel as a woman. I don't want to take the time to, 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 to get to know your kids. See, if I get to dating you and coming off, I got to meet your parents. See, I got to deal with. And then if we go on a few dates, uh, 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 if you get into some trouble, need some money to get your, your, your car note or bills, or groceries. See, I got to invest. I got to spend money. I got to do all this stuff. All this just to have sex. See, because that's all they want in the first place. So therefore, I'm going to bypass the process of a relationship working towards engagement and marriage and just get straight to the perversion. So therefore, now... I don't see you as a woman. I see you as a place to deposit my perversion. I see you as an object of my sexual desires. So now I'll just come straight to the point. How much? What it's going to take to do such and such. And so I bypass the process. And it's sad that Sunday service is happening the same way. People now, because of a lot of false teachings and church being misappropriated and misrepresented, now people are bypassing or trying to bypass having a relationship, a personal relationship with Jesus. And so then they bypass the process of being pruned and purified and sanctified 
And so now they just now come and just throw a 20 or 50 or hundred dollars in the plate and try to play guard God like a harlot to get their needs met. <laughs> just put money in the plate, go up to the pastor, have him lay hands on them and prophesy on them or say a word of encouragement, then leave out of church feeling as though they blessed, feeling as though their situation is going to turn around and change. Why? They don't know God. They don't have a relationship with God. They're not taking the time in his word to meditate, to pray, to walk it out, to work out salvation, not to improve on what Jesus done. Jesus is the only way you can be saved. So working out your salvation with fear and trembling, fear is in reverence, not being afraid of, like scared of. Working out your salvation means you working from a position of salvation. You working from a position of grace and truth. You working from a position where you're not being condemned and judged. That's what that scripture is talking about. And so then people then coming to church playing God like a harlot. Just here's some money. Now meet my needs. See, this is this is people not understanding what this thing is all about. And so then as we submit our lives on the altar. Remember when you come to an altar, this is when you have an altar call. An altar is a place not only of sacrifice in the Old Testament, because God says submit yourself as a living sacrifice with your reason service, but in the New Testament, again, the altar is a place of marriage. That's why God said come as you are, not stay as you are, come as you are. Because a marriage is about to take place where vows is exchanged for better or for worse, sickness or for health. That's why Jesus said, I shall never leave you nor forsake you. That's a marriage vow. God, agape love, unconditional. That means in your sickness, in your spiritual sickness, in your wickedness, in with your evil self, with your angry, bitter, disturbed self, with your fornicating cheating self, gambling, getting high, drinking self. God said, I still love you. I still treat you as a man would treat a bride who don't do none of that. I love you like you faithful. I love you like you honorable. I love you like you truthful. I love you like you merciful. I love you like you forgiving. Why? Because I have a plan for you. I have a purpose for you. I have covered you with my blood. So when you're looked upon, I don't even see you. I see what covers you. I don't see your flesh, your fleshly self. I see the spirit that lives in you. And so like the scripture says, they have no knowledge that set up the wood of their graven image and pray unto a God that cannot save. We turn to money thinking that it can save. We turn to self-medicating thinking it can save us from our problems and the pain that we're going through trying to escape. Turning to other women thinking it can save us from loneliness and save us from, from feeling that desire of erotica and exoticness. But yet we have a misconception because we've been beguiled in our thinking. Our mindsets have to change and we have to think on these things. God, Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And no one can come to the Father except through me. No one can get to the source of who Jesus is in the spirit until they accept what he's done as a man on the cross. And so we have to understand if Jesus is Lord, if Jesus is King, then we must let him reign. We must let him rule. So the question I'm asking you today, why is Jesus king? That's a question that only you can answer because it's a personal question and only you can answer it. He's king over my life because I serve him. I submit to him. I love him. I belong to him. My life is his. My wife's life is his. My family's life is his. 
We lay our finances, our job, our health, everything belongs to his. For we have ownership of nothing, but we have stewardship of everything he's entrusted upon us. And we walk in the uncompromised truth representing the true life sanctuary, a body, a temple not made with hands. So we let God rule, rest, and reign in our lives. And we pray that you do it too. God bless you. Till next time.